I now request K. S. Ravichandran sir for the thematic address. Good evening everyone. It is my pleasure in welcoming all of you here for this Step Up with Startup program. The whole idea of uh, this program is, I will say, we had 30 years of experience, we can say. Three decades of experience is whole lot of things and you will definitely be able to map the journey of 30 years you would have understood how many people we would have interacted how many projects we would have handled how many startups though the name startup may not have been associated how many people would have founded multiple organizations industries, service providers in several sectors. Our firm has been in sector agnostic service in the whole lot of, we can say, corporate, managerial, legal and IPR protection and all. This experience is definitely needed in our opinion to start up from the start. That is the underlying premise with which our firm thought it fit to bring before you a host of experts also. The ultimate idea will be to have a pool of mentors, brains, having years and decades of experience so that there is some guidance available outside the, we can say the government system to help startup in every aspect of their life and growth. I think that is the fundamental premise with which we thought we will have this program organized. And the main intention is to ensure that at any stage, whether it is the thought stage, idea stage, to creating, organizing, growing, at all these stages you may need guidance and this guidance is required to be provided by seasoned people because there is lot of uncertainty in the market there is lot of disruptive elements in the market there is always you have to have the strength to weather all these storms difficulties disturbances, expected, unexpected, anticipated or otherwise. Such is the environment today. We are thinking at this point of time somebody would have done it. We may not know, notice it. As you think somebody would have done it. That is the kind of environment in which we are living. The second aspect of our environment is running. I am not you know, uh, referring to in order to stay where you are now you have to run. I am not saying that. I am saying that we need to be running today to keep pace with this. So you have to climb the stairs faster. Your ability to run is very important. Today we don't have the patience to look, you know, in the lift. We don't have the patience. I will say this experience probably some of you must be also having it. That few minutes it's a difficult time for me, I will say. You, know, you should have the patience to wait. No, that is not possible. Only in hospitals, maybe there are patients. Patience is going to be not there. And therefore, the service, the industry, the sector service that you are providing, the goods and services you are going to provide from a startup stage, must, must be able to work in this environment. Technology is sweeping today that whatever you may think of doing today is done by somebody who is not I mean human being so in this environment also there is hope 
That is why we are sitting here and looking at it. There is whole lot of information available. There is no depth of information today. Whole lot of support is available, whether it is state government or civil government. And this kind of environment is, in my opinion, a best environment for the purpose of laying the foundation for startup. And in order to give you the right kind of guidance and connect, we have my friend Ram Krishnan Kalyan Raman. We have my friend Vishwanath Parameshwaran and Mr. Vishwasaran Ram. We have an enterprising individual, my friend Mr. Maharaj, Madam Goyatri, and our partner Santanam Madhusudanan. They are all experts in different fields. And this particular event, I thought I'll say only this much that focus on the core competencies, anticipating the risks, understanding that yesterday's solutions may be the cause for the today's problems. Building a, building a good governance framework, building good human resources team, building a good balance sheet, and above all, being transparent, being fair, integrity and transparency are the buzzwords of governance. If you are able to remember these mantras, and if you are Startup is founded on these values. I'm sure, I wish it will be great and there will be no issues about it. And world over, business failures are not any longer required to be considered and hidden as something which is a taboo. In the beginning itself, let us understand this. Absolutely, there is no problem with respect to failures because they are the stepping stones of success and therefore we will be able to achieve it. I was just reminded about the quote that Justice Seshwai, the sitting judge of Madras High Court, I happened to invite him recently for a program. So I saw in his WhatsApp status this particular statement. It's a very interesting one. He says, this is our moment in the history of our nation and in human civilization. This is our moment in the history of nation and human civilization and what best can we do is what you, all of you are going to ask and do, perform. Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful words, sir. Successful fundraising requires a company pitch, a, a clear business plan and a focus on showcasing the startup's potential for growth and profitability. We have Mr. Ramakrishnan Kalyanaraman to share insights on this. Friends of the dais, Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you. Uh, before I start, how many of you are startup entrepreneurs and or how many of you want to start up a business? Can you put up your hand? That's a reasonable number. Uh, I think uh, KSR left it on a very optimistic note and uh, we didn't exchange notes between us. Uh, that was in fact the starting first part of my presentation, right? I wanted to cover four things as I spoke to you. The first was the India opportunity or the startup opportunity that is there in front of us. The second is what are the key ingredients of success? The third is what are the misperceptions that entrepreneurs have? And the fourth is what are the minefields or fault lines that are there which people will have to kind of navigate and be careful about it. Uh, these were the four broad segments that I wanted to kind of share my thoughts. And uh, KSR left on a note where he quoted uh, just a sage side. I think in, in the 33 years that I have been involved either raising money for companies or selling companies or buying companies, I don't think I have seen a more uh, vibrant and optimistic uh, face ever. Right? 
at each phase of the economic cycle, we were always having some sort of challenge or the other. Right? Uh, if, if the economy was stable, you had a political challenge. If economy and political system was stable, you had a you know global challenge. I think either because of either the alignment of staffs or because we have been patient enough and we have waited for long enough, we are at a time where most of the staffs for at least India has aligned. Uh, you have a stable political system and you have a demographic profile which is quite favorable for us. When I talk to uh, an entrepreneur who is setting up a mother and child hospital, he is optimistic about his business and optimistic about demand, about children being born. When I talk to a person who is setting up a K-12 school, he is optimistic about his demand. And at the other end of the spectrum, when I talk to somebody who is setting up a geriatric center for old age people, he is also optimistic about his demand. Right? So the entire spectrum, thanks to the demographic profile of this country that we are currently facing, and we probably will have it for another 10-15 years, we are not going to have it for eternity, is, is driving a lot of factors in favor of the country. It's driving demand at different cohorts of the market. It is driving wealth creation at different cohorts of the market. It is driving availability of talent at different cohorts of the market. So I think demographic profile is something that we are we are yet to capitalize fully. But if we do the right things, it's it's a gold mine that we are sitting here, sitting on and which we can capitalize on. The second is we have gone way past the world insofar as the digital backbone of the country is concerned. I don't think even in developed countries in Europe or in the United States, you can transfer money at the pace at which we are able to do it in our country, right? I have to give you a simple data point. So the digital infrastructure that we have built, we have always been complaining that we never had physical infrastructure, right? We always complained about poor roads, poor sanitation, etc., etc. But I think when you, yeah, we still have poor roads and poor sanitation. I am not trying to hold a brief on that. But if you leave it as it is and you look at the digital infrastructure, I think we have created a super highway, right? Compared to any other part of the world. And that is going to go hold us in great stead in either enabling a lot of people to come into the mainstream economic activity, for people to offer their services and products and reach it out to lower cost to a large segment. So the second is the digital backbone that we have created. Right? The third is, not only is India having its strength, the world is having its problems. Right? The rest of the world is having its problems. And because the rest of the world are having its problems, we seem to be benefiting from the problems of the world. Right? You have a problem in Ukraine. You have a problem in the Middle East. You have a problem in the Red Sea. Right? You have a problem in South Korea and North Korea. You have a problem with China and United States. So if you see any other part of the geographic landscape of the world, it seems to be having some problem or the other. And we are seen as an island of hope. We are seen as an island of peace. We are seen as a you know democratic friendly country where people can commit capital and people can kind of you know make meaningful economic returns. So the geopolitics is aligned in our favor. So that's that's the other dimension. The next dimension about the India opportunity is the amount of money that is there, right? At $2,600 per capita, we are at an inflection point in terms of demand for most services and products. Most developed countries took off at around $2,000 per capita and then kind of, you know, demand exploded. So we are at about $2,600 per capita. Now, $2,600 per capita is on a denominator of 146 crore people or 145 crore people, whatever number it is and whoever is counting, right? Now, if you were to look at only the top 100 million people, which is the top 10 crore people, right? The 10 crore people's per capita income is as high as that of the global standards, right? So that is why if you see most online businesses are catering only to the top 100 100 million people, which is roughly 20 million households. Right? So you have you have an opportunity of a long tail of all of them trying to come into the mainstream. 
So the 2600 per capita is only going to increase and potentially we'll get to the so-called developed country, you know, benchmark of somewhere around 10,000 or 11,000 dollars per capita. So there is a significant amount of domestic wealth which is getting constantly created, which is available for startups, for businesses to kind of exploit and sell products and services. If you listen to most uh, commentaries of most listed companies, everybody is today talking of premiumization, right? The premium products are going off the shelves very fast. You know, yesterday, Mr. Suresh Narayan, the managing director of Nestle India said, look, while on one hand we complain about the rural demand not being there, we have substantial amount of premiumization which is happening in most of the products. Right? So you are straddling a large market which is expanding and a significantly affordable or a luxury or a premium seeking market which is very unique to India. Right? Most of the other geographies, most parts of the world, you probably are saddled with an aging population who are more obsessed about savings. Right? Here, because of the demographic construct, you have one segment of the population which is actually saving and spending and the other segment of the population which is actually seeking a better life. Right? It is not seeking the life that the previous generation was used to. And this is a tremendous opportunity for startups who can come up with meaningful products and services. So that's, that's the other India opportunity that is there. The next is financialization of savings. Right? Historically, most private wealth was locked in either land or gold. And increasingly, private wealth is moving towards financial assets. Right? Even if somebody wants to take real estate as an exposure, they are better off taking real estate exposure through a REIT, right? which is a real estate investment trust. Or if you want to invest in gold, you are better off investing through a sovereign gold bond. Right? And all of this is not possible if you have not done the digital backbone. Right? So you have the digital backbone, you have disposable wealth, you have financialization of savings. And the combination of these actually present a significant amount of market opportunity for businesses to go out and capitalize. The other point I am just borrowing from what KSR said, which is also what I wanted to mention. Entrepreneurship is no longer a tab. It is an accepted profession for the most part. You speak to, you know, 20, 25 year olds. I don't know how prevalent it is in Bangalore, but if you go to a place like Bangalore, you go to a place like Pune or Hyderabad, most 20, 25, I mean, last weekend I was at, uh, I was in Bangalore uh, at the uh, alumni meeting of the National Institute of Technology, Suratka. NIT Karnataka Suratka, where about 500 alumni had come together and uh, I would say about 30% of them are entrepreneurs, right, who are running their own businesses. There were students who came and pitched ideas, right, uh, because it was, it was an event where, you know, bankers were there, investors were there and there were third year students, second year students who were actually coming and pitching very, very meaningful and path breaking ideas. So the India opportunity is here. I don't think we could have, we can expect or we could have expected a better time to go out and do something meaningful and create economic value. So that's the first part. And I want to kind of establish it and leave it there, right? The second is what does it take and what are the key ingredients of success of a reasonably, you know, sustainable and meaningful business model? The first is having said that there is an opportunity, you need to ensure that you develop a product or a service where there is a meaningful product market fit. That is I think the most critical thing. You need to have a product or a service which you can offer to an identified segment of the market where the product market fit is very very established. And when I say product market fit, there has to be a felt and an established need. You should do something which is quite different from what has been done. So you talk to any investor, you talk to any startup, they will say PMF, product market fit. The product market fit becomes extremely critical. The second is, you need to have worthwhile unit economics. You cannot aspire to build a business where you are not making money at a gross level or you will never ever make money at a gross level. Between 2008, after the global financial crisis and 2008, 20 or 2019 till COVID came, the world was in an expansionist mode. 
the size of the Fed balance sheet, Fed is the Federal Reserve of the United States, the size of the Fed balance sheet expanded, which means money was there. And all the money that Fed was printing and pumping found its way into the financial market ecosystem and it found its way into countries like India. Right? So you had all the private equity guys, the venture capitalists coming, the public market investors coming, so on and so forth. Going forward for the next 10 years, however much there is an India opportunity, I think we are, as and dollar is a reserve currency, so we, we need to be cognizant of what happens to the dollar and what the Fed is doing. We are going to get into a, an era of compression. Most people expected the dollar to kind of announce a rate hike yesterday, but they have paused the rate hike, but the rate hike is just around the on, right? It's not going to have, it's not going to be deferred forever. The, the US has already said that they're going to have three rate hikes in, in the current calendar. So we are going to get into an era of compression. And the reason why I'm saying that is you are not going to have free money come. Between, between 2008, and more so during the later part of the last four or five years during COVID, you had substantial amount of money sloshed around in the world. And all sorts of businesses got funded, right? Whether they were making money, whether they were not making money, whether it was unit economics positive, unit economics negative, whether there was a line of sight to make money or not, I think businesses got funded because capital was available. That doesn't mean that the businesses were worthwhile to be funded. It is just that there was liquidity and the liquidity found its way into businesses. So I think anybody thinking of starting up today should make sure that there is a product market fit, there is a positive unit economics. And cash flow is the only reality, right? As Ms. Narayan Murthy famously said, revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is the only reality. So it is the only reality, right? I will only go on to add that valuation is delusionary. Right? <laughs> Insanity. Yeah, or insanity. Right? So please don't even go there. Right? So be cash flow focused, have your PMF, have your positive unit economics. The next point, which is a key ingredient of success, is starting up is a marathon race. It's not a sprint. You may have to run like a sprinter because that is the pace of change that is happening. But you have to run a marathon like a sprinter and that's not easy. It is a marathon race, you have to be mentally prepared for running that marathon. Second, the pace of changes are so dramatic and so frequent that you should not get fixated with something. You should have the resilience and the flexibility to pivot or adapt the business model to the changes that are happening around. Vish and I were talking a while ago about how the landscape of the manufacturing sector is changing. We are clearly going to have a lot of manufacturing company which existed the last 20 years, not going to be there in the next 20 years. And now who is going to disappear is a question of, you know, we sort of fate. But, the, but at a broader level, simply because of the impact of technology and the pace at which technology is invading uh, businesses, I think you are going to see a change. So you need to have the resilience to be able to adapt. So resilience is very, very critical. Unit, product market fit, unit economics, focus on cash. Right? These are some critical ingredients of being building a successful business. I, attached to that is being responsible to your stakeholders. And I'm carefully using the word stakeholder as opposed to shareholder because every stakeholder in your remit or in your network is very, very critical. Whether he's a supplier, whether he is an employee, whether he is a customer, whether he is a shareholder, whether he is your lender, every stake or whether it is the families of each of these entities, right? So that is extremely critical. So stakeholder responsibility at the earlier you build a business keeping stakeholder accountability and responsibility in mind, the better it is because then you don't have to, you know, suddenly one fine morning wake up and discover that you have not attended to it. And the other is ESG is not is no longer a first word. ESG is, is real. It is not a first world problem. It is not a big corporate uh, issue. It is not a semi guideline. Right? It is going to be a way of life. Right? SEBI may put it as a guideline because they have a job to do. Well, that, that's okay. You know, he's a regulator, he has to write something. There will be companies that all of that, right? And uh, you know, Mr. KSR will make sure that people follow it. 
But I think it is a way of life. It is very, very integral to your DNA. Because your customer is not going to buy from you if you are not going to be ESG compliant. Right? So it is a question of survival. The next generation of people are not going to buy your products if your product does not fulfill certain criteria. Right? The youngsters are being extremely careful and conscious about what they wear, what they eat, where they go and uh, you know spend their money. And they are looking into the back side of the cart to see whether you know you are compliant with a whole host of things. Whether it is the you know, whether it's the quality of the food product, whether it is the face cream that somebody somebody applies on their face, seeing whether it is vegan or whether there is chemical there. Yeah, I see that lady, lady nodding very vigorously. That's 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 where we are getting to, right? So ESG in some manifestation or the other, in some form or the other is going to be a way of life, it is already a way of life, right? So unless you put all these factors together, you are not going to be building a very sustainable business. At different points of time, when you seek to raise capital, each of these factors will come to haunt you, each of these factors will become relevant. KSR told me that I need to speak on raising capital. That is the easiest thing. Okay. In 2024, businesses will not fail for want of capital. And, and I can say that with all the responsibility and accountability that I have. Right? Back in the day, India was a capital staff country, India was a credit staff country. When I started my life in 1990, 91, when I started my professional life, we were a credit star and a capital staff country. We had to go to Delhi to the controller of capital issues to get approval to take a company public. Today I go and tell clients, please don't go public ever. You can meet all your growth capital needs from private sources. And the entire continuum of starting up to making enough money to fund your own growth, you have different forms of capital provided. You have friends and family, you have incubators and accelerators, you have individual angels, you have HL networks, you have VC funds, you have private equity funds, you have late stage funds, you have free IPO funds. You name it and you have it, right? In between you have venture debt funds, you have credit funds. So no startup today can ever say, and when I say startup, I'm talking of a meaningful startup which has attempt, which has addressed all the key ingredients of success very carefully. I am not talking of some guy who just says, I am also a startup, I have, you know, I have started. He's not going to get money, right? If you are a meaningful startup, then you are unlikely to suffer for want of capital. You may fail for a variety of other reasons, and I am just going to come to that in a short while, right? But you are not going to fail for want of capital. And that is, that is the reality today. There is enough money. There are enough entrepreneurs who have sold their businesses sitting on truckload of money who are wanting to go out and invest in other startups. They are evangelizing the whole startup, you know, revolution that is happening. You go to a place like Bangalore, there are people walking with, you know, millions of dollars in their back, right? Who, people who have just made successful exits and who are looking to invest, right? They are not going to be indiscriminate about it. I am not saying that they are just going to be throwing it. But if you have your basics right, and if you have a business model which is, you know, meeting all the criteria that I said, then I don't think capital is going to be an issue. So you can raise capital, you don't have to go out and raise capital. And please also understand that when somebody is investing at the startup stage, you don't have enough empirical data on the company to take a meaningful decision, right? People are taking decision based on more on subjective parameters and a certain belief. So I think people need to get convinced about the size of the market opportunity. People need to get convinced about the business model, about the unit economics, about the ability to scale, about the energy and passion of the entrepreneur to be able to run that distance, right? And his fundamental capability. And their ability to get an exit at some point of time once the business keeps scaling, right? So as long as these are met, more often than not at that stage of capital raising, you don't need people like me who do larger deals. The capital providers will reach out to you because they have their teams, they are doing their research, they are sectorally focused. So for example, Wish is very, very focused on manufacturing as a sector. 
So I'm sure in his research and in his, uh, you know, assessment, he'll be seeing and looking for companies which are interesting, and they will actually go out and reach out to you. So if you are an interesting startup with a meaningful idea, right, with a sensible product proposition or a service proposition, you actually don't have to go and reach out. And I'm saying that even in a place like Coimbatore. I am conscious of saying it in Coimbatore, right? I am not sitting in Bangalore and saying it, which you don't have to say because they all know, right? Even in Coimbatore, I don't think it's, uh, it's necessary. Capital is no longer an issue. Capital is available. And we rest assured capital is available. So you can take the capital variable out of the equation and focus your energies on building the fundamentals of business in a more meaningful and in a more sustainable and enduring manner. Having said all this, there are several misperceptions that startups have. And that is where the problem starts. And that is where disappointment sets in. That is where there is a certain amount of dissonance. One big misperception startups have is that they believe that the main object of the company, as written in the memorandum and articles of association, the chapter document of the company, is raising capital. It is not raising capital. It is to provide a product or a service at a price point which is acceptable to a market segment which is waiting for that product or service and can provide you that opportunity for a reasonably long period of time. You can write it in whatever language you want to write, okay? But it is certainly not raising capital. I think that is a fundamental starting problem, right? You believe I am starting up only to raise capital, then I think you have a problem. You have to go and have your head examined with a you know, qualified profession. The second challenge that, that is there is, while I said that the India opportunity is, you know, what it is, there is also an hype and overestimation of the India market opportunity. And that is something that we have quite painfully realized in the last about 10 year, 10 odd years, right? Because people came enamored by the 140 odd crore people that are there. But if you actually slice it and dice it, you only have about 10 crore people who are buying most products and services at a meaningful price point which can make businesses sustainable. So you are only talking to a very, very limited set of the market. That market is of course expanding. I am not saying that the market is going to be stagnant or static. It is expanding. But people have gone out and overestimated that. And because they have gone out and overestimated that, you know, and because money was available and we were in an expansionist kind of economic uh, cycle, money is also went and got invested in some of these businesses. And today you are seeing the problems of that. You are seeing reverse gear being applied. You are seeing Paytms having problems. You are having, you are seeing Baijus having problems. You are having, you will see more of them having problems uh, as, as we go on, right? It is an overestimation of the market size. The third is, every startup believes that raising capital is a birthright. It is not a birthright. There were roughly about 59 odd deals that happened in the state of Tamil Nadu in 2023. Right? I'm talking of you know capital invested across various stages. You don't have only that many companies, right? You have significantly more number of companies. So please understand that your business model may not be a value creating model which will be amenable for capital raising. It may still be a viable business. I'm not. I'm not trying to pass a judgment on the business, right? It may be a cash flow generating yield business, which you can still run without even taking one rupee of capital. Before I came for this meeting, I was sitting with somebody who runs a 140 odd crore company, and he tells me that he runs it with 40 percent EBITDA, and he has been doing it for the last 25 years. In his lifetime, he is not going to raise that rupee. Right? He has built his. He has built this business so brilliantly. So you don't have to necessarily right. So raising capital is not your birthright. Next is startups believe in immortality. Seventy percent of startups fail by the tenth anniversary. Fifty percent of the startups fail by the fifth anniversary, and that's statistics. I don't want to bore you with statistics, but I just want to give it to impress or underscore a point, right? So it is not immortal. You will fail, right? And you have to model for failure even as you get into this. So don't believe that, you know, you, you are Bhishma Pitama who is going to live for eternity. It's not going to happen, right? The other challenge is 
When you get the first check, you believe that your business model is validated. No, it is not. Only 2% of the startups, and I repeat, 2% of the startups survive to raise what we call in our language as a series D round. Series A, B, C, D. Only 2% of the startups. About 4% of the startups raise series C, 2% of the startups raise series D. So you, are, you not only have mortality, right? you also have a lack of money being available. After you have raised money, I am not saying without raising money, you raise seed round, you raise series A, you raise series B, but you can't raise series C, right? So you are failing. So it's, it's actually a you know, uh, waterfall of uh, money not being available. So these are some misperceptions because you read the Economic Times headlines, you read CNBC, you read some number that is being thrown, so many millionaires. They, they, they tend to, they are selling stories, right? Uh, that's their job. So they will sell the stories. The reality is there for people to see and please ensure that you internalize the reality. And more often than not, if you don't, if you don't respect the key ingredients of what will make a successful company, you will fall prey to the misconceptions and not recognizing this and falling prey to this is a deadly combination, right? You, you cannot get out of that, you know, deadly combination. The last point I wanted to touch is some fault lines that are there and these fault lines only add to the complications, right? And what are those fault lines or what are those, you know, minefields? First, foremost, I am not a big fan of making, I, I mean, I generally don't like the word celebrity and I certainly don't like the word celebrity when it is used for an entrepreneur, right? Whatever he is doing, I think he is doing a job, you have to respect him for it, right? We tend to hero worship people way too early and there is a problem in doing that because they don't build sustainable businesses after that. And particularly in this age of social media, in this age of instant gratification, in this age of everything being, you know, immediately being broadcast, I think we start celebrating success way too early. And that is something that we probably need to be a little constrained. We, we started waking up to Mr. Narayana Murthy after he was probably 60 years old. We started waking up to Mr. Ratan Tata after he was probably 70 years old, right? But why do we wake up to somebody who is uh, 20? You know, it's, 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 I mean, startups have always been there. Tata Motors was a startup. Ashok Leland was a startup. Everything was a startup at some point of time. Now, I think this whole euphoria that we are creating can be moderated to some degree is my personal view. I may be, it may be an unpopular view, but I have held this view everywhere, that I think some amount of moderation will, will help. Right? The, the other minefield that you need to be very careful is falling prey to the growth momentum that is set by any investor who is sitting in your cap table. Primarily because an investor comes with a 3-5 year time horizon. Unfortunately, entrepreneurs also believe that they have to build those businesses in 3-5 years. Nothing gets built in 3-5 years. If you build something in 3-5 years, the next 3 years it will collapse. Right? He, is, he is having a 3-5 year time horizon because the people who have given him capital need the money back in 3-5 years. Right? So there is a very, very, you know, what should I say, there is an extremely strong asynchronous wave between the time expectation of the capital provider and the time at which businesses can build. Warren Buffett famously said that, you know, December 31, I mean, American companies close their year in December 31. December 31 is an artificial deadline. Business cycles don't follow the calendar time. So it's like that, right? So business cycles don't follow the capital availability time cycles. So that is a challenge. When you, you know, pump or pump prime the business more than what is required, then you are setting it up for disaster at some point of time. So you need to make sure that you are building it up in a calibrated manner and not and trying to manage the expectation of the investor with this. And that's why when you take capital, you should be very, very clear as to how you are going to get that guy out. It is famously said that a private equity investment is a marriage contract with a divorce clause return. Right? Because he wants his exit. And be cognizant of it, right? There is nothing wrong because that is his life. 
So you are entering into that wedding clearly knowing that you are going to have a divorce on this day. So prepare yourself mentally for that divorce. Don't try and you know do something as though you are going to hold hands and walk into sunset. It's not going to happen. Right? He's going to drop you somewhere and you are going to fend for yourself at that point in time. The other is governance. right? When you try to succumb to the pressure of growth, you start cutting corners in terms of business practices. You start cutting corners in terms of governance. You start cutting corners in terms of moral, ethical and acceptable social behavior. And that again causes a significant amount of strain, loss of investors money, setback for the entrepreneur and a whole host of problems. So that's a minefield that investors should, I mean sorry, entrepreneurs should be very, very cognizant and very, very careful of. I mean you see so many of them in the newspaper, right? Particularly in the last 12 to 18 months. The number of startups that have failed simply because of governance issues are way too many. And if you actually double click on them, it is because either success went to their head very early or there was pressure on them to perform which was beyond what the markets can absorb or what realistically, you know, something will kind of blossom into a sustainable uh, business. Then of course you have regulatory ch challenges where the regulator can pull the carpet under your leg. The Paytm Payments Bank license has been cancelled, period. I mean, short of cancel, he has done everything. And yesterday's speech, the governor is not giving any any handle whatsoever that he is going to kind of, you know, reconsider it. The same business could have been built in probably a slower manner, in a more sustainable manner. Right? So the regulator is here to keep an eye on you. He is not going to be sleeping and turning a blind eye to, you know, all misdemeanors of, you know, whoever is doing it. He is there and he is going to act. And when he acts, he will act with a very, very strong hand. The other is technology. You need to keep pivoting your business, right? And you don't know what the minefields are. And that too in the age of, you know, artificial intelligence, you really don't know how the business models will just kind of get jettisoned. Or you need to kind of completely reconfigure. So those are some minefields that one needs to be cognizant of. So in summary, I think I have overshot my time possibly. Uh, in summary, I think the India opportunity is great. Make sure that you build businesses which have the key success ingredients. Right? Don't agonize over these misperceptions that people have. Just ignore them. And be very, very careful and wary of the minefields as you navigate through, through this journey. Thank you very much for your patient listening. All the very best. For the wonderful insight, sir. We welcome Mr. Krishnaswamy Ravi, CFO of the Roots Group of Companies and Director of Roots Multi-Team Limited for the event. I request CS Jayalakshmi to welcome sir with a planter. We next have Mr. Vish Sarsar Namam to enlighten us on incubators and accelerators. Over to you, sir.
You know, Jai, so I keep telling her there are three things I can be absolutely sure about when I take a, a Chennai to Coimbatore Indigo flight. The flight will have pilot, the flight will have a crew, and the flight will have money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, somehow I've, I've never uh, you know, encountered Dr. K. Sir, but I can't think of the last time I flew from Chennai back to Kambutur when I didn't see uh, C.S. Manjula. So anyway, so it, it good, it's good to be here. Thank you for, uh, you know, again, the opportunity. Uh, I've been given the topic incubators uh, and accelerators. Um, so I, I think we'll have to sort of, you know, understand the why uh, before we get into the what and how of, of incubation and acceleration, right? Now, one disclaimer before I get started. I don't see incubators and accelerators as different things, right? I think that would be akin to saying uh, a manufacturing company doesn't have distribution, right? It doesn't make sense. Uh, a manufacturing company has to figure distribution. Either they don't do it or they get uh, a distributor to do it. And I have, uh, you know, CFO of Roots. I'm sure he understands the value of distribution and retail. You can't just do manufacturing, right? So to me, uh, it, it can't be separated. They're, they're, so I always say Forge is an incubator, we do acceleration, right? So that's one way to sort of uh, set the context. Now, we're talking about a startup, right? And I want to understand, I want to help you understand how I think of a startup. Right? And what I'm going to talk about actually can is related or relevant only to a very specific definition of startup. So it's important for us to take whatever I say in that context. Right? So let's go back uh, 23, 24 years when uh, my good friend uh, uh, Murugavel uh, Janikaram started BharatPatrimony.com. Right? Now, what was he doing? He was basically saying, well, here is another way to get people married. Right? In the sense that uh, you know, a man finds a woman, a woman finds a man, and and but this is something that has always been happening ever since uh, you know uh, humanity has been marrying people, right? In fact, I think it was Robin Williams that said marriage has possibly changed more in the last 50 years than it did in the last in the preceding 5,000 years, right? So 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 basically, we had a marriage broker, we had a marriage agency, somebody used to put uh, you know uh, advertisements on classifieds on Hindu. They were running it as a service, right? They used to have a, a you know a real estate for which they were uh, paying rent to Hindu, and then they would just get all the ads from people and just put it there, right? So it wasn't exactly uh, something that was new, right? So let's say Bharat, it was not BharatMatrimony.com. Let's say it was Bharat Matrimony, and he started a marriage broker service. Would you call that a startup? I don't call it a startup. Why? Because it wasn't doing anything innovative about how value was created, value was delivered, and value was captured. There are three things that matter to a business. Right? You've got to create value. You have to capture value. And prior to that, you've got to deliver value. Right? So I create value. Roots, multi clean. How, does it, how do they create value? They, they manufacture a product. Right? And I have to deliver value, which means I have to take it to the hands of my buyer. And then I have to capture value, which is I charge a price. Right? And if I can do that profitably, if I can create value, deliver value, capture value profitably, and if I can do it scalably, that's the kick. So BharatMatrimony.com was creating value, delivering value, capturing value, but at scale. If Bharat Matrimony was a broker service, it wouldn't have achieved scale. So you've got to understand the difference between a new small business and a startup, right? So I start a store. Yeah, it's a new business, but is it a startup? No, it is not. It's a small business. Why? Because can that store scale? How do you scale a retail company? You just add more number of stores, which means even if I had 100 store, the rate at which my revenue grew will be linearly proportional to the rate at which my cost grew. These two curves won't diverge like that. A startup fundamentally can achieve high growth, where revenue grows at the rate of nx, on an order of magnitude higher than the rate of growth of cost, when cost grows at the rate of x. That's the fundamental thing about startup. So what is a startup in that sense? A new company proving the potential for high it is going through a phase where it is saying, well, I'm going to prove that I can achieve high growth. So what is this venture? A high growth company. So a startup is the phase before 
a company becomes a venture. So what are you as a startup? I'm a new company that's trying to prove the potential that I can achieve high growth. Yeah. Now, Ramki spoke a lot about you know, venture capital, private equity, money available in the market. Let's understand what the sweet spot of where venture capital money flows in. That's basically for startups that are entering a market that already accepts that this product will sell. Take Amazon. Was there one product on Amazon's catalog that was not already selling? Right? So what did Amazon do differently? They brought technology and they took the scale of how much they can sell to astronomical levels, exponential levels. But then, was there proof required that this book will sell, this shampoo will sell, this CD player will sell? No, they were all selling. And that's the point he made about product market fit. Is anything about Amazon's catalog? So Amazon was launched in 1995-96 when Walmart was about 30 years old. And Costco may have been what? I don't know, 60 years old. So retail was not exactly new. It has been happening for 100 years at least before uh, Amazon came in. But what was Amazon doing differently? Technology. technology. It was using technology to achieve high growth. So it didn't have to go through this what I'm showing as stages in the x-axis. So that's a very important question for us to ask. And I'm talking about technology startups. Right? You start with an idea. It's a, it's a new scientific idea, a new research that has come from a lab. Now you've got to take it all the way to, a, to the point where it becomes a product that you and I will happily buy. Now when I, whether I go to the market or my friend Mr. Santanam goes to the market, this laptop is the same. That's why you got the product, right? But then some stage before, it, it, was a, it was a project where somebody was trying to prove that I can actually put computing in this kind of a form. I'm taking you to maybe the early 50s. But now there has been no product. I no longer have a doubt that it will sell. That's why I say product market fit. VCs don't invest in companies that are yet to prove product market fit. Am I saying it right now? And, and this is exactly what they're looking for. But beyond product market fit, what also matters is product-led growth. I'll give another example. Imagine somebody in the early 2000s, when Zoho was maybe a, it wasn't even Zoho, it was AdventNet, right? And maybe maybe it was fifth, sixth year in its in its life. And somebody said, well, that's, a, that's the next Infosys, that's the next PCS, that's the next HCL. Would have been a huge mistake, right, Ramki? I mean, let's say Ramki said, well, that's another info that I'm not going to invest. In case you the people did come and ask you for a check, which you never did. Right? Yeah? Right? The point is this. It was a product model. Right? He decided that I'm not going to get into technical services and remain a services company. I'm going to actually build and scale a product company, which means I need to get to product-led growth. Whether it's healthcare, whether it is banking, whether it is uh, manufacturing, whatever be the sector, right? That I'm taking IT uh, solutions to, I'm going to make it a product, productize it. So that product-led growth is a very significant milestone for a technology startup to achieve. All right, now let's move forward. So this venture, what is a venture? I know it's Friday afternoon, <laughs> and I'm acting like a professor. It's, I get it. High, but then, high, it's a high growth high company. Growth. High growth company, right? Now, for this high growth company, think of it as this rocket that's ready to take off. It has two engines. Innovation, BharatMatrimony.com. It has innovation, right? Yeah. And then growth, it has to grow. You think of growth in terms of customers, users, revenue, profitability, sales partners, channel partners, growth. Ultimately, it will lead to top line growth, bottom line growth, which will keep our CFOs very happy. Right? Now, for this innovation and growth, for these two engines, you need the fuel. For innovation, the fuel is technology. So, what did BharatMatrimony.com do? Dot com is technology. They said, I'm going to use IT infrastructure and reach out to anybody and everybody out there, whoever has a computer connection. 
and, and possibly those days it, it, it used to be uh, browsing centers, right? I still recall my dad, you know, went to uh, a browsing center in, in Salem, which is where I grew up. I was actually in Canada and he said, I've created a profile for your sister. Can you actually, uh, you know, log on from Canada and make sure it's okay? And then can you send it to, you know, uh, people that people in your network and you send it by email? I said, well, I don't know how to do it. Bharatbank20.com will do it, right? So distribution, right? Also, so product creation, service delivery, distribution, everything has technology built into it. It means it can go international scale. In fact, my brother-in-law, is one Indian American in New York, he saw the uh, profile of my sister on BharatPatrimony.com, and then yeah, the rest, as they say, is history, right? So this is this is something we need to keep in mind. And for growth, venture capital, right? I kind of differ with Ramki when it comes to venture capital. Uh, I mean, I agree to the point that venture capital is not the end; it's the means to the end. Right? And I think that's where uh, people tend to gently get lost in terms of making this the engine itself. But you need money to grow faster. Right? So what does it all you know, bring us to? So a startup, a, tech, a technology startup, a company that's trying to prove that it become a high growth company, right? starts with assumptions. I'm sure Murga a good friend, so I can go by his pet name, right? So Muruga, Muruga, Janaki Raman, right? He had a lot, he had all kinds of assumptions, right? The problem he's trying to solve, the market size, TAM, as they say, target addressable market, in terms of what the demand for that product or service is going to be, the idea, the vision for what for that company, right? Technology, innovation, product or service, the business model, and then the team who will actually be able to not only build this company, not only sustain this company, not only grow this company, but actually ever last this company. That's the point Ramki was talking about, right? And you have longevity built into your DNA. Assumptions, I call it fairy tale, right? My job, my day job means that I hear startup pitches at least five a day. Not very different from what my daughter went through, I have a 10 year old. Every night we'll have to tell stories, fairy tales, put her to sleep. I don't feel any different from that. I hear fairy tales, fairy tales all the day. But I'm basically saying, can you move this fairy tales to fact? Right? So, the assumptions, somewhere within those assumptions is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to build the next high growth company. But then, it's juxtaposed against risks. So let's understand what these risks are. Very important. I look at risks as four types. Customer risks, which is, will you buy that product? Will you pay for it? Will you use it? Will you come back and keep buying it? I mean, imagine somebody who launched the first shampoo ever as a branded product. Would have had that doubt. Because he's basically saying, well, will people say, I'm not going to use soap for hair wash and I'm going to buy shampoo? Big assumption. Yeah, but then today it's not a big deal. Today if you launch the... 200th uh, shampoo brand, it will still at least have a niche, if not a mainstream market to, to get it. Then comes product. Will it work? Can I manufacture at scale? Can I do it profitably? Can I distribute it profitably? Right? All kinds of risks. Then comes market. Where do I enter the market? Do I enter at the premium end? Do I enter at the middle? Do I enter at the mass market? How do I go? Do I go bottom up? Do I go top down? Or do I go after a niche? Do I do market substitution? Do I do market penetration? Do, or do I do market creation? Right? All kinds of ideas. Ideas, assumptions, fairy tales. And most importantly, growth. The market will grow at this rate, CAGR. So I, my, my company will grow at this rate. I mean, come on, what's the big deal? Excel sheet gives you drag. Just drag the damn thing. Right? Why stop in 10 years? I mean, drag 100 years for all you know. When Ramke actually will give you two more points for the effort you've taken. He's not. The, <laughs> right? So all these risks, what does it come to, finally? I want to build a venture. I have all these assumptions. But there are these risk factors. So what do I do as an entrepreneur? What do I do as a founder? I build evidence. I build proof for all of those assumptions. 
which is why I think technology entrepreneurship, innovation and technology entrepreneurship is a scientific pursuit. It's a process. There is science. And uh, uh, one person, uh, Mr. Steve Black, who, who teaches now in Stanford, is uh, referred to as the guru of uh, modern technology entrepreneurship, calls this evidence-based entrepreneurship. There's another Indian uh, by the name of Dr. Saras Saraswati. She's created this framework called effectuation, which actually again talks about the fact that there is method to this madness. Of course, there is magic, there is maverick, and if I ask my friend Vish, he'll say, well, I'm anything but method. And, yeah, I mean, you can't take the magic and the, and, and, and the magnetism away from the person. I'm, I'm sure his, his better half will only agree with what I'm saying, right? But there is a method, right? Now, can we teach this method? Yes, we can. Can we help entrepreneurs learn and apply some of these techniques and tools? Yes, we can. Right? And that is the, the job incubators will have to do. And I, I agree with Dr. KSR. He, he said it in different words, but how I say it is only coaches can, only players can become coaches. Commentators cannot become coaches. Right? Which means you should have been there, done that yourself. You should have, you, sh you should know what it takes to start a company, start a business, run it, run it sustainably, run it profitably, and possibly even scale it up. You should know how to go through those steps. Which is actually why, very surprisingly, I'm not surprised though, but people are, biotech incubators in the country are relatively more successful. You know why? Every single head of a biotech incubator has a been there, done that, scientist who's actually successfully taken multiple lab research scientific concepts into at least you know a technology license. You may not have commercialized it, but you would have taken it to some bigger company which said, well, yeah, I like that research. I'm going to take the technology license and I'm going to do the commercialization. But that's good enough, right? So that's very important for us to keep in mind, right? So Basically, you know, this is where I'm coming to the topic of this uh, session. So uh, thank you so much for the patience uh, <laughs> extended, right? So the process from idea to enterprise is basically a start. It's a process. Think of it as a process. Think of it as a value chain, right? So you start with an idea and then you move to a prototype. What have you done? You're showing a value price fit. What, is, what does it mean? It means that I put a prototype into the hands of my customer and he says, I'm willing to use, I'm willing to pay, and I'm willing to come back and use and trade and be made. So the willingness to use and the willingness to buy, there's only one way to prove it. Put a product, put a price, and you buy it. Short of it, doesn't work. It's very good. Right? And can you do more of that? Which means if I can find more such customers, what, do, what, what, what are many customers who want the same product? What do you call it? Market. Right? So that's where you go into, and this product factory fit obviously is because, you know, my uh, incubator, we focus on hardware, uh, products, industrial systems. So not only do you have to have a, a lab ready uh, product, you need to design it and optimize it for, you know, production. Right? Which is, which is very important because otherwise you will, uh, you know, be what, what we call penny wise and pound foolish. Right? You won't even know uh, what's the correct price at which you have to sell because you have to take away a lot of uh, recover a lot of overheads in not just manufacturing but in production and so on right so you go into the product you have a product factory fit and you know the large market from which you're going to generate demand and that's when you get closer to product market fit and this uh, picture that you see which has the small light in fact so, uh, sorry for the uh, resolution it's basically meant to uh, indicate light at the end of the tunnel, right? Now, imagine you're on this, uh, you know, lonely highway, you know, moonless night, and all of a sudden you're in this tunnel, and you're shot. I mean, like, you're, generally your speed will definitely come down, you're, you're very cautious whether you're going to hit the side or, or, or not, you're going to be very cautious. But then the moment you see the light, you're not even at the end of the tunnel, you're only seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, you'll start racing towards it because you feel safe, right? Now what that light at the end of the tunnel basically means is profitability, right? Can I, if I keep generating revenue, 
uh, you know, sort of predictably, repeatably, and can I get to that point where this business will turn profitable? Because please understand, there is enough proof of a managed broker agency running a profitable business. But before BharatMatrimony.com came, was there proof that a BharatMatrimony.com can be run profitably? There was no proof. Muruga had to build that proof, right? Which means as he went about generating revenues, he's saying, well, am I seeing light at the end of the tunnel? But a good entrepreneur will wait to get to the light, to the, get to the end of the tunnel. But a great entrepreneur will say, well, scale. Right? So I don't have to achieve profitability. As long as I show that I can repeatedly, predictably get to the point of profit, I can start scaling. Right? So that investment scale fit is where funds come, is where VCs come, where you need a lot of money and you need the right team in order for you, for you to not only uh, sustain the company, but to actually scale it. So managed incubation, and I'm putting incubation and acceleration in, in, in together, right? We don't see it as separate. We call it the five M's. The first is the means, right? So for the kind of startup that we engage with in, uh, in Forge, we have, we call them manufacturing tech startups, manufacturing startups, or product manufacturing startups. We give them labs where they actually can take their idea to a working prototype. We give them product innovation labs, product compliance labs, and very soon we're going to be starting a pilot production factory. Right? We operate seven physical centers in seven different uh, cities in, in Tamil Nadu, so Coimbatore, Osur. In Chennai, we have in Sri Parambudur, we've just recently started a center inside IIT Madras Research Park. We also have Salem, Trichy, Madurai, and Tirunel Valley. In fact, another uh, bigger uh, center is coming up in, in Madurai. Just two weeks back, I got the approval from uh, the State Planning Commission. Uh, so that's uh, whatever we have in Osur and Sri Parambudur, we're going to be replicating in Madurai as well. That's uh, next financial year uh, news. Uh, this, you know, it's family, so I'm just placing it here. Right? Method. How do you do it? The tools, the techniques, the methodologies, right? We'll have to give them the, the training, we'll have to give them the mentoring, we'll have to give them the guidance, expertise in say business, in technology, in manufacturing, whatever it takes to make them successful. Mentoring, right? Now think of mentoring as specific and very specialized interventions for startups. For example, a sales expert coming and helping fix the sales process for a startup. Or someone like my, my friend Ramki here saying, well, I'll help the startup put together a proper business plan so it becomes uh, you know, compelling or, or ready for an investor pitch. Or getting a, a, you know, a corporate governance uh, a professional to actually come and clean up this company before we're able to take it to uh, investments, right? Uh, and and uh, I've, I've started engaging uh, my better half in, in many of this because many of the startups that we end up uh, you know, investing are not ready. Right? So we'll have to go and really sort of clean the house before we can put money in. Right? Then comes market. See, the one thing which I believe, right, incubators haven't done enough in, in this country, and, and to me this is like uh, an acid test. Any incubator that has done well will have done market access really well. Because usually what happens in incubators is you focus on the supply side. You focus on the inputs. You give them space, you give them money, you give them mentoring, you give them technology, you give, 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 give. Right? But then what about the demand side? The only way the startup is ever going to be successful is if it starts selling. Sell to whom? So can we get the customers? So market access is very, very important. Right? So we'll have to think about, okay, who is the best shot, what I call the bullseye segment for customer or the startup. Let's actually go. That's the work we need to do. We can't wait for the startup to do that. Can we go ring fence that and create the pull? from the companies. What it, what, it, what it does, it takes away most of the risk that I showed about in the previous time. So that's a very important act, uh, you know, and the last is money. And the last is money. Ramki, I'm very clear, right? The last is money. Right? <laughs> the last is money. Very important, right? So we in Forge, we do uh, innovation grants. We start from as small as five lakhs. We go all the way up to a crore when it, when it comes to seed investments. We also invest in the form of equity. But we stay in that startup for a much longer time because we don't have the pressure of a three-year, five-year, seven-year fund uh, cycle. We don't have to give anything back to our LP. We don't have LP, heck, right? <laughs> right? So, but we stay with them. We also ensure that when we go in as investors, we are always the co-investor, which means we bring another lead investor. That's validation. 
I can just as an incubator put one again, but that's like, you know, uh, my father will give me one. Right? Sometimes he's entitled to do that. <laughs> right? But can I get another lead investor to come and say, well, this is a, an interesting startup. We will invest. And what we do as a, as a co-investor, because we're also uh, incubator to the startup, we make sure that the terms of the investment are founder friendly. Because a lot of exploitation also happens. Right? I mean, very recently we had to clean up the cap table of an IIT Kanpur startup, which had given away 9% equity to professors and the wives of those professors. IIT Kanpur, right? And the former defense secretary called me up and said, Vish, this is what's happening. Can you fix it? I said, yeah, sure, we fix it. So we had to go in and fix it, which actually meant talking to those professors and saying, what you're doing is wrong. Which investor around people will come and invest in a company which has 9% given away, pledged to spouses of persons? Right? So we have to get to clean up. So this is this is where I, I'm going to stop here. I do have a few more slides on, on Forge, but I think I've already overstepped uh, my welcome, so I will I will end here. But this is incubation acceleration in one simple uh, you know one one picture, right? Five M's is what you'll have to think of. Right now, you may be an agri uh, startup, you may be a Deep to see startup, you may be a fintech startup, you may be any startup. Your incubators, your accelerators have to give you this. So find those that can give you all these five M's effectively and in a timely manner. Right? Because you're a premature baby, you're at risk. Right? So every second lost could be more. Right? So with that, I'll end. Once again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for those wonderful words, sir. We know enterprise resource planning is an essential tool for any fast-growing business that needs to optimize its systems, keep up with consumer demands, and scale its operations. We now have Mr. Vishwanath Parameshwaran, a creative technologist, to share his thoughts on the importance of ERP in governance. Over to you, sir. You heard very interesting aspects of startup about raising money and getting incubated and actually becoming something big. This is the part where the hard work comes in, in making it happen, tracking everything that you do so that it makes sense for the investor to come in. Uh, I would actually keep it to uh, fundamentally from a startup's perspective rather than anybody else. And I would actually say that ERP is a term which is used usually by the, the big boys. So startups don't gravitate to ERP. My case here is not in that sense of ERP, but technology is a must when we walk into the startup landscape. I'll just take you through some of the aspects. So this is our usual understanding of startup. A couple of people starting off something new. And the question is, why do we need an ERP? Can't we just wing it until we make money? And once we make money, can't we bring in some specialists to the, make everything right? Like, uh, wish that clean up <laughs> the acts that we have done. So, interestingly, what is ERP? So, ERP is a way of looking at management information systems as a single platform that you can look at human resources, you can look at CRM, you can look at your finance and reporting and everything, in a single platform you can look at it. So that you don't have to, uh, then you have an interesting insight and where it is going. So just put it out there. You can do your ERP interestingly on your Excel sheet as well, if you are capable of you know, putting together all of that. But as the other part of ERP, which uh, was mentioned is governance. So what is governance? That's the next question. So governance is actually when you set up structures, structures can be your board, structures can be your you know, uh, meetings, anything that you structure you put up. And then you create policies how to be done. You create processes how to be done. And you bring in people who will execute on that. Now, all of these things together has to work to make this happen. Here you can see, 
The small boat here is the setup. And the big guy out there is the big MNC or whichever company you think about. The question is that you say, hey, he needs all these things because he has 200 employees, he's doing all of those things. So he needs a system. I have five people, why do I need a system? So always that's how, that's how we start. But end of the day, you realize that you might be small, but you also have five people. You also need to find your clients. You also need to track your money. You also need to grow your revenue. All of those things, whatever the problem that the big guy has, you also have. Interestingly, uh, while, when I started uh, my uh, career, uh, it was almost like a small setup. We started off and all of those things. And we are doing well. It's a very large multinational advertising company came and said, uh, to take me away and said, you become the CTO of our company. So in, the, in that conversation, he actually brought this analogy because he was telling, wish you are in a speedboat. We are an oil tank. And it's like, you know, you guys do this fancy stuff, that fancy stuff, we are here to stay. Actually, that analogy creeped me out. Because I didn't want to be an oil tank. <laughs> so, end of the day, after I said I need 10 more days to come back, it doesn't sound that interesting. So I, I went back and said, no, I would rather be in the speedboat. I will change it later, not now. So at the end of the day, uh, it, there is advantages. I mean, if you look back, I would have said, ah, did I do it wrong or right? <laughs> I will think multiple times. But at the end of the day, the excitement is there when you take the speedboat. But you sometimes let go of the structures that you need to make it work. And this is something which every entrepreneur thinks that he will do it, don't worry about it. I mean, next tomorrow, maybe next month, we will do all of these things. We can sit down, we can get it all right. So, the other part is, why do we think, yeah, this is not good for us? Why do we think that ERP is not good for us? Because ERP has got a bad name, that ERP is expensive. It's too much technology to disrupt us. So, I mean, that was an old school thing. Now, all of this has changed. Technology is much more uh, accessible to you. It's much more cheaper to you, that sort of thing. And some of the, if it's a technology startup, they build it from scratch. You don't need anybody else selling them what needs to be done. The other part, interestingly, the term ERP really came in the 50s and 60s. That's when, uh, in US, uh, the grocery sales and the supermarkets actually really grew. And they found that to get all that products you know, on the aisle, getting you to buy and doing all those things. They needed huge amount of planning. And that is where the first time this, the word ERP came into being. And interestingly, if you look at it at that time, the current idea of a shopping bag, current idea of cashiers all in line, all of that happened the first few years of 1960s when all of this planning was happening. But if in 60s, grocery guys could do ERP, I mean, in 2024, can't be a startup don't do any ERP. At the end of the day, technology has become extremely cheaper for us to sort of deal with it. We have the right resources. I mean, we have it. In India, that's another interesting thing I find. You go with a solution to any large or small companies. If it's a technology solution, the company believes that I have enough engineers to build it. You know, so it's kind of, we think that it's on our backyard, we can do it overnight, so why do I buy anything new? So similarly, I feel that adoption of technology is something that we should look at and say, why can't we do it? And how does it harm us if not helps? And the, I'll just, another interesting fact, I mean, as I have worked with a lot of startups from a point of view technology, I've invested in multiple startups in point of view technology, done multiple startups and failed, <laughs> and went through other parts. So we have seen that startups keep on pivoting. Like, both uh, Vishal when he said, uh, if you don't pivot, uh, you might really kill yourself. And uh, end of the day, pivoting for the right reasons also makes sense. And usually, you will pivot three, four times sometimes because you, you go with an assumption. There is a concept called pace layering. So when we look at a landscape, the landscape changes, you know, very rarely unless an earthquake happens. The hill is a hill, and then you create a plot. That plot, maybe in 50 years, I change the plot. And then build a house in it. That house, somebody might, you know, and one generation will break it, another generation will make it faster. Within the house, if you look at it, 
I mean, people will come and go, build, build walls, build things and everything else, pasture and all of that. And the furniture, you look at it, we keep on changing daily or weekly. Now, this is called pace layering. So what happens if the landscape changes faster than the building? Everything comes down. What happens, you know, when uh, you know, your, your house structure changes faster than your furniture? Again, everything comes down. So this happens, not only this layering of pace happens across the board. So if you have garments changing faster than fashion, then you are in trouble. Similarly, everywhere what we see is that, but we are in such a space right now. The market is changing, technology is changing. I mean, earlier somebody could have come and said, I know Java, the next 10 years is still safe for me. Now you can't. What you've learned today is obsolete within six months. Or somebody else has sort of brought in a completely new language, the AI shows that sort of thing that's happening. So in that space, how do you even look at something which is like, everybody says that, Startup is a place where we have to have long-term view. How do you take a long-term view when the landscape you see that you can't make sense of it? So there is one part of grid and determination that a startup entrepreneur can have and say, hey, I'm going to stay here, I'm going to try, I will figure this out. But on the other side, there are like which there are scientific ways of looking at it. Am I working with building blocks which I can use? For example, these are actually interestingly two things built out of Lego. The only problem is that they are very custom Legos. So if you take it, you can make only a ship or you can make you know, only a Eiffel Tower. But if you get to other things, like the regular classic Lego, you could actually build it. Again, again, you can build multiple shapes. So end of the day, when we figure out technology, we look at it and say, the technology I am bringing in, the ERP I am bringing in, whichever platform I am bringing in, can it change with me? I mean, the way I would have managed my human resources, that doesn't change that much. The way I would have looked at my profitability, that doesn't change that much. So fundamentally what changes is if you're a technology business, that technology is what is changing. But the overall part is not changing. So you could actually say that, hey, I need to have visibility. I, mean, I need to really spend time thinking that what am I adopting? I mean, end of the day, uh, even uh, you can see learning management systems, all of these things are changing in, in, in everything. So we looking at it and saying, what are the things which are constants or which have a smaller pace of change? Can I stick to it? Can I bring it onto my system which I'm onboarding, which will take me through? So these are things that we need to sort of really look at. Another thing which we have seen startups do is there's a lot of SaaS problems as they call it. I mean, fundamentally, startups say technology is easy. I will buy this uh, software, that software. So there are companies which have about 65 software being used just to manage some of these things. I mean, and mostly happens in the US because it's very easy to get a SaaS license. I mean, others, there are companies which are doing 12 at a minimum. So we have seen when we go and implement a solution, we actually remove 14 solutions from there, end of the day, because we can actually have one single solution to take care of it. Now, SaaS prawn is extremely easy because you pay $10, $5, you have five people, it's great. Then you forget that you have to scale. You forget that the insights that you get so one of the biggest problem of buying in technology, we also do that. No? We want to do something, we use email to communicate, we use WhatsApp to communicate, then we actually go into Google Sheet, we add some things there, we have Excel. Now, if you are running your enterprise, you want to have an understanding of what's going on. Your data is in WhatsApp, your data is in email, your data is in the Excel sheet, it's in all over the place. How do you even understand that you know all of these things contribute to your profitability or not? You know, so again, we sit, so instead of data working for us, we work for data. We sit down and again, spend another 10 hours to come out with something. And next, one, one month again changed. So end of the day, you're doing a catch-up game. Whereas, like everybody else mentioned, that you have to be really fast. Somebody is innovating what you're thinking about yesterday. If that is the case, if we are catching up with technology, that becomes a huge problem. So one of the things we have to do is that, we have to let go of the fact, I mean, our fear of bringing it, bringing it on a platform, a single platform where we can get insights. And we can look for it, there are a lot of, lots of work there. The other interesting fact is that on, a, on an average basis, right, companies spend almost 30% of their time searching for this. Again, for the same reason. It's very productive time. Where is that file? Where is the email? Who sent that thing? Where is the template? We just keep on doing that. And we consider that these are all, I mean, 
If you really ask me, people consider that this is work going on. End of the day. So, a lot of unproductive work goes because we have everything fragmented. So, the idea of an ERP, or don't even call it an ERP, the idea of a single platform where you can bring all your different aspects of your uh, uh, company and where you can, so I call it the single source of truth. Yeah, so it's kind of, you have to have a single source of truth. If I bring in, for example, a customer data on my platform, I should be able to easily sort of select it and share it with my in the internal colleagues say, have a look at it. Instead of exporting as Excel, sending it to him, bringing it back, all those things. So we need to look for, can I adapt any single source of truth platform there, out there? And nowadays there are SaaS platforms, cloud platforms, everything else. So you could figure out what is the best option for you. And there is a lot of other aspects to it. Because once you bring it, again, these are the aspects of what you call uh, accountability is extremely needed for governance, transparency is needed, and sustainability is needed if you are a good governance. Now, accountability comes from what? If knowing who actually you know, made this happen, who actually gave the order, who actually did the action, who, you know, where did it come from? Well, this the buck stops, right? You can trace back. Now, if it is done through phone call and say, please go ahead and send it for 10 bucks, nobody will know well, who said that. And most of the time, we actually hide behind that. We make it a purpose that we don't write it anywhere. End of the day. So, whereas the new norm, and then again, I feel most of the time what happens is that when we look at kids, we know that they have to be taught discipline when they are small. So that they grow up to be disciplined. You know that at 40, you cannot discipline someone. I mean, it's very challenging, you can, unless some, somebody put a gun to your head, or a, a, what do you call, a health situation comes at you. But why do we think that startups or individuals or young uh, entrepreneurs don't have to follow anything in the beginning, and they will all start following five years from now? So end of the day, if even if you're doing a three people startup, if you have all your data in one place, even if you actually make sure that document everything, saying who did what, why are we doing this? If that culture comes in, I mean, end of the day, this cannot be because there is a, uh, what do you call, people said that you have to do it. It has to become a culture in an organization. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I mean, the way we are taught how to respect elders is not because somebody, you know, told us, you know, they take the other card, look whether there is, you know, 80 or above, and then, you know, both up. Nobody said that. As a culture, when we were growing up, we saw how other people are treating, how we are treating. So once we realize that, we realize that we can give respect to not only elderly ones, anybody who needs the respect, we can give it to them. And that, that was part of it. So having a culture which actually respects software and its what you call tracking. Uh, and, and the way of doing that, we should really make sure that data is captured. So all the evidence which says, you can't take it out of any variance. So only if you have data captured saying that I had X amount of sale and this is going, and again, sometimes what happens is that if you don't have the data, you miss out opportunities where you, you didn't notice that a particular client has been buying uh, for a long time from you. And only the third quarter, you look at the Excel sheet and realize, oh, he stopped buying, what happened? And if you had the data real time, you would have gone back and said, why I didn't see from you? Can tell us the reason. So end of the day, you need to have insight because you are selling and where from will you know what the customer wants. And other than software, any other way you do, it just gets trapped in different layers of marketing, different layers of sales and everything. It never comes back to you. One of the core advantages I've seen with customer or customers is that after we kind of did the entire sort of digitization, uh, it's very interesting because they can go back and sort out issues, like even simple issues. Uh, there was a place in which you have, uh, what do you call, uh, food processing is being done. So they realized that most of the time in the morning when they go, there are, you know, uh, flies coming into the food processing zone. And it was a mystery for them for a long time. Unless, until we digitized it. Then they go and went and looked at it and they realized, oh, at 7 o'clock actually a delivery truck comes in, everybody opens the door and brings the food in. You know, delivery for, of their goods only. But that is the insight you get, otherwise you never get. Because somebody will say, somebody opened the door, left it again. So how can you have a random door, a door being closed? No. So once they knew it, they changed it. They said any delivery which comes to the our premises should be before 5 o'clock. So that insight would not have come unless somebody had tracked it and said, okay, this is the time when the delivery came. So it's very interesting that it is not only 
financial data. It is all the data of everything that happens. And that actually is governance at the end of the day. Capturing every bit of it. Just, and one more, one more thing I want to just say is that we are all believe that building a business is really about you know, finding the customers, selling to them, and you know, making it. Actually, it's about creating processes. If you want to scale, the only way you can scale is that you know uh, you have created a ro robust process where you know it can be replicated across the board. So building processes again the, at the core of governance. You go in and say what kind of process. If a customer does a complaint, how do I address it? If something uh, somebody else gives a feedback, how do I address it? Each of them, every, each and every, even, even hiring, it's a process. So what are the criteria for it? How will I hire? How often do I hire? All of that, the policy and the process has to go hand in hand. And we always say all of these things are not interesting, no romantic enough for a, uh, what you call entrepreneur. You know, all of these things. I start doing things. Anything financial, my better half is here. So I would say I do all the fun stuff. Anything that I don't like, <laughs> she gets to do it. Uh, now she does a fantastic thing about it. That, but I also realize that I lose a lot of insight if I don't get interested in that. End of the day. So it happens with entrepreneurs and first generation, those who come in. That, oh my god, you, you get caught up in your idea. But end of the day, you need to understand the other side of it as well. So, last part, you have to consider any single platform that you can bring in into manage. Uh, I, I'm not calling it ERP because I don't want to scare you. Think about a single technology platform where you can actually bring in all your sales information, financial information, your customer information, all your, what do you call, uh, employee information, learning, everything in one place. That will be your next best friend. So that's all. I, I, I want to sort of uh, put it out there. Last bit, just because we talked about governance. Interestingly, the word gover governance came from Kebarna. It's a Greek word, which means steer the ship. So steering a ship uh, is fundamentally, doesn't mean that you have, you have the steering wheel. It also means you know you have processes in place. When the wind comes, I know who will go and actually put up the stuff. You, you, I, I know I've organized everything else. The last bit I do is drive. So governance actually means you have already done all of these processes and you have the steering wheel. And the new steering wheel of the new CEO is looking at his dashboards, looking at his data, so that he gets insights from everywhere. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. everyone. for the insights on the role of ERP, sir. My dear friends gather, uh, can we have a small deviation from the agenda? Can we hear from Mr. Krishnaswamy Ravi about the taxation aspects before we take a break? Thank you. We now request Ravi, sir, to enlighten us with the taxation aspects related to startup. Just 27 years old. 
What is the average age of US citizen? Is 38 years. The average age of Chinese, 39 years. The average age of Japanese, you don't see any growth in Japan today. Main reason, 42 years. Because the senior population is dominating there, where younger population is dominating here. The senior population has to be supported, but the younger population will support the nation. So that difference, normally when we talk about startup, I think people who can take the risk, in people. Yes, that, that could be innovation or development of a new product or process or services which will lead to high scale and employment and all that wealth creation. But it should come from the instance. I think that demographic different advantage India has got. So with this, I think the startup will play a very crucial role in India. We have data like how the growth has been there over the period of time. We are close to, I think, 117,000 or like 17,000 startups spread over 763 districts and employment opportunity to 10 lakhs plus people and all that. So this is a point which I would like to emphasize that definitely they will play a major role. So coming to my topic, the relief, tax relief. So the funding is provided, you have the assistance from incubators and all that, you have the technology in place for the startup. So income is assured. When the income is there, that's a taxability. So the government in 2016, thought we should definitely give some advantage from the tax angle. Because once the, because you know, if you pay tax, there becomes an expenditure where it has to be brought back into the business for the growth. So coming to the tax relief, maybe some of the points which from the income tax point of view I will highlight, or maybe you come to the GST paying. So coming to income tax, we have very, very old popular section AGIAC. I think every one of you is aware. That section says, if the startup, as defined as a startup, and as you get recognition from Department of Promotion of Industries and Internal Trade, which we call Interministerial Board of Certifications required, that becomes your eligible under AGIAC. So what you are eligible? They say you are you are not required to pay any tax on your income. What we talk about net income, income minus expenditure, which we are supposed to pay for all kinds of assets, whether it's a partnership form or a proprietor or a company. So AGIAC, what does it say? First, you should go to the portal and get recognition from the board for board of certification is required for you to apply under AGIAC. So three years out of 10 years from the date of incorporation or from the date of registration, any three years you can select out of the 10 years and get exemption from the total, total exemption from the tax bill. That means you are getting some X income. That is X income is not going to be taxed at all, irrespective of the value. So normally people will select Maybe not first three years because any business you require gestation pay, correct? The first year, second year, yes, you are not going to make profit. So normally they select middle or the last three years of the, the block, which is consisting of 10 years. So that is a huge advantage provided the entity is either a company or a limited liability partnership as defined under limited liability partnership. Act 2008. So, LNP or company. But if you go to the recognition, the recognition says you should be a private limited company or registered as a partnership form or LNP. So, see that there should be definitely a private limited company or registered as a partnership form or LNP. But when you come to income tax AT, IAC, Either you should be a company, that means here only private limited company is recognized, but here it can they use the general word company, not registered partnership of only LLP is covered under AGIAC for getting this exemption of 3 years out of 10 years. So as usual, other conditions remain the same. You should turn over, should be less than 100 crores. I think that they stipulate under uh, the Department of Promotion of Industry, it's also the same condition. And you should not 
form an entity by reconstruction of the already business which is in existence. You should start as a new. Then, whether I can use the plant and machinery already used in some other business, second hand, imported and all that. Yes, you can use, but in fact, as ATIAC puts a condition, not less, not more than 20% of the total value of the plant and machinery, you can have second. So, rest you must buy as a new one. <coughs> so, with this, I think ATIAC, actually it was supposed to get expired on 31 3 2024. That means the startup should have commenced operations before. 31st March 24. But you can see a couple of days back the budget was the finance bill was released. They have extended the date to 31 3 2025. That means <coughs> the intention is to promote more startup. So why not we give one more year to have people think and have the startup and get this advantage of tax spending. So we have another 10 years. Another 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and then you can choose any three years. But not all, all the 10 years, the exemptions are available. So, uh, the one more thing, uh, I can uh, suppose maybe few years you would have carry forward losses, or maybe first year, second year, third year, but you like exemption, and <coughs> any business loss or of your other maximum period you can carry forward is 8 years. Here, one point uh, Section 79 of the Income Tax Act talks about that. Because it's very specifically applicable to a company in which public are not substantially interested. That means private equipment is finally covered. If they have carry forward loss of the earlier year or years, they can set off within the eligibility period, <laughs> maybe eight years' time, in the year in which the company makes starts making profit. So you are allowed to set up. But with a very, very clear rider in that. So what is the rider is not less than 51% of the shareholders carry voting power on the last day of the year which the loss has been incurred. Also carries 51% of the voting power on the last day of the year in which the loss is proposed to be set up. So now, assuming some Five, six promoters start the business. They are holding more than 15 percent and still holding. But what happens in between the startup comes with an issue? Maybe private placement. Now what happens? Your 50 percent may not be there. You will be getting dilution in your share holding, maybe 50, 49, or 45, 40, etc. So generally speaking, this provision very clearly not do not allow. But we have a proviso in section 49 which says that if it is a startup, eligible startup, what is eligible startup? The startup recognized under Department of Promotion of Interstates and Internal Trade and who doing business in the business field of innovation, development of new product, process, services, or uh, business with a high scalability which amounts to increased employment or wealth creation. So, you are a startup with all these conditions, a private limited company or a uh, LLP partnership of with now your turnover should not cross under close at any point of time during the previous year and you are an eligible startup. If you are an eligible startup, then they are giving alternative. What is alternative? Either 51% you can take or all the share 100% of the shareholders of the company on the last day of the year which loss has been incurred. Also continue as shareholders same 100% on the last day of the year loss is proposed to be set up. That means some 26 shareholders continue on both days. In between some new shareholders have come and diluted the percentage because the company has given some private placement. So that facility available only to start which you are recognized at the the same definition, what is the IAC carries and what your recognized and uh, maybe. So here one more point. Now I, I will uh, give link this to very, very latest section introduced by income tax. I think every one of you are very should be conversant with that. Section 43B, sub class H. 
this year applicable only from assessment year 24 25 that means financial year 23 24 any company buying from a micro small medium enterprise micro small enterprise not medium as defined under micro small enterprise medium enterprise development act it is defined and you buy goods from micro small enterprises you are liable to pay within 45 days maximum period of 45 days irrespective of the term you have entered with the other person even the micro small say i you can take 60 days not a problem but if you are liable to pay as per section 15 of msme act within 45 days so what will happen if the company which is buying right, that company could be a micro small medium or a big size company not a problem so the buyer could be of any entity but the supplier is micro small if they don't pay within 45 days it will be the expenditure the total expenditure when what i say is whatever goods value you have purchased or what are the services value you have availed only it doesn't apply to trader it applies both to service and product will not be allowed in the year of inquiry will be allowed only in the year which the amount is paid assuming 31st march 24 you have got goods from micro small uh, uh, that enterprise micro small enterprise as defined under the act msme act and there is a balance due on 31st march 24 you see first to march the goods have been received approved quality quality wise approved because acceptance is very important you have given your acceptance now you are supposed to be on or before April 14, so where the 45 days gets over. Suppose you may don't make payment on April before 14. It will not be allowed in the year 23-24. It will be allowed only in the year 24-25 where you have made payment on 1st May or 1st June or even 20th of April. So see the liability, the goods value getting disallowed or services value getting disallowed. So I believe that most of the startups could be coming at a micro small initiate at least for a few years because the condition itself is uh, 100 crores. Uh, it is not an advantage, definitely it is an advantage especially from this. So people should be very careful this year onwards when we make payment, when we see the credit of balance on 31st March 24, whether we make at least direct payment to micro small <laughs> enterprises if not to others because of the disallowance nature. I think many, I think many big corporates have requested for extension or deferment of this provision. I don't think that will be given. So I think that that is that is a point indirectly benefiting the startup also. So coming to the other section, we all have heard about angel tax. Angel. That means we have section 56.2 B of the Income Tax Act penalizes the persons or penalizes the entity which is again a company which is not public or substantially interested we can take very well private limited company not applicable to partnership or not applicable to the register or limited liability partnership when they issue shares you have a fair market value but receiving money more than the fair market value they say you are indirectly enriching the company so you will have to pay tax the difference between the fair market value and the amount you receive. Assuming the fair market value comes to 200 and you will receive 500 rupees per share. So 300, the difference will be taxable under income from other sources. So in that period, I say, because this is a law which again you will say, what is the fair market value? Where, where we will have to follow. We have rule 11, which talks about the fair market value, how to govern rule 11 U and 11 U, which talks about that. It is nothing but either two methods prescribed because there is amendment, so I, I want to touch the point. The two methods is nothing but very simple discounted cash flow method, net asset value method. Now, last year there is an amendment. They have prescribed five more methods because 56.2b was again amended. This originally was amount received from the resident. Now, they remove the word resident. So, even if you receive money from abroad, this company will have to pay tax if it is exceeding the market rate. So to accommodate the startup, the startup really will be requiring funds as we have already heard that 
lot of funds initially required to enable the startup to grow. So they could be received from abroad, but this will hurt. So what they have done again, Levin View UA amended, five more group methods prescribed. So comparable price method. Like that, we have five more methods in addition to net present value and then discounted cash flow method. So this way, probably your fair market value could be maybe when you calculate, could be more and probably the difference could be less or the difference could be ninety five. So the fifty six two again uh, B seven B fifty six two seven B again goes to advantage of uh, I can say some sort of relief, especially to startup. Yeah, and yeah, and investors when they invest because they say they expect return to be more. So again, the tax the taxability comes here. Ultimate return to them will come down. So that is a point. And we get good sections, of course. That is uh, now uh, got over fifty four double E, which I would like to get uh, only the capital gain relating to sale of a long term capital asset and you invest in unit or units of fund, which is also startup. Which is but uh, unfortunately, it was there up to 31st March 2019. I think now the section, if you have invested, fine. But now you cannot go and invest and, and claim uh, maybe deduction under section 54W. There's one more section which was introduced 54GB. Again, good one. You sell a residential house or a plot of land and you invest in enterprise, it could be startup. Startup is specifically covered, or at least it could be a micro, small, medium enterprise. In buy the shares, then they go and buy new asset. That means once you sell a residential house, all of you are aware the capital gain will come. The difference between a sale and index cost. Now the differ that amount is coming. You have to pay tax. Suppose you want to avoid tax and invest the entire net consideration on the sale of this residential house. In a company which is a startup for the shares. Then that company, within one year from the date of subscription by this person who is a transferor of the residential house, should buy assets like plant and machinery and all that. And there are two things there. <coughs> Other companies cannot buy computers, computer software, but startups are allowed to buy computers and computer <coughs> software. So this condition was that maybe the last year was 31st March 22. I think uh, probably I don't know whether again it will be taken, but as it is 23, 24 doesn't cover. It's a relaxation to the capital gain to, with the basic objective of plumbing back the funds into the business for the start. You asked me one of the other sections which very clearly covers maybe uh, startup. There's one more section called perks, you know, salary. Uh, employees get perks in addition to the salary level. So, the perks which is given in the form of sweat equity shares or specified security to the employees by the startup, very specific, specifically covered in the only startup. What they say, the after 48 months from the date of allotment, either directly or indirectly, for consideration other than cash, any specific equity or specific equity shares, it should be taken as a perks in the hands of employee, not immediately. So that is a thing which section 192.1c covers, which is a tedious section on salary, which covers that and read to section 191, which talks about the tax as we pay for it. So what I would like to say here, several sections like this, the startup has been given advantage, I, I can say, a kind of relief. But the major relief, there is no doubt, Section 80 IAC, which also they have specifically, maybe extend the date from 31 3 2024 to 31 3 25. So that is the biggest, biggest advantage. So if you ask me, what are the other, maybe GST point of view, any advantages? Yes, GST generally advantage because, you know, the 2000, we talk about one nation, one market, one tax. On India level, the logistics gets facilitated. If you want to good to get goods from say Mumbai, you get within two three days. Where it used to take some seven days, ten days, twelve days, and all that. The other one, what what that is there. If you ask me very specifically, any specific advantage with respect to the startup where they mentioned, I think one point is there. 2023, they given uh, 
the tax relief of 18%, which otherwise charged on the satellite launches. Suppose if you launch satellite in India, uh, maybe from India, and the satellite launches need not pay 18% tax, the domestic satellite launches. So that one advantage very specifically talks about the GST relief in a uh, startup. Otherwise, what are the general advantage, IDC, and all that which are applicable to others, all same thing they it talks about that. Uh, I think probably otherwise even companies have talks about the same thing, uh, no specific provision for startup. And if you take, I think uh, this is Dr. Ravichandran could have covered insolvency provision <laughs> process, you have section 55 to 57 specific on uh, startup. Uh, so this is a general maybe point which you asked me, which is to be uh, understood by the startups today. Because uh, when they, as they earn profit, sometimes the profit could come from year one or year two, it's uh, depending upon the product, depending upon the process and depending upon the services, what they do. I think they should be clear that they get registered and all things make, made ready before the, they start uh, climbing their action. So, I thank once again the organizers for giving us an opportunity for here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for explaining about the tax benefits in a simple and coherent manner. As Ravi sir has another event scheduled, he is taking a leave from the event. So, I request Ravi Chandran sir to felicitate Ravi sir with a memento.